So the question that we are entering into now with chapter five is right off the bat, what exactly is being critiqued? And I suggested that a good way, uh, a pathway to, to go down to start to focus on what exactly is being critiqued in the Babylonian culture was to note how Belshazzar treated the very same temple vessels and furniture, gold, silver, and such that had been brought out of Jerusalem at the very beginning of this book in chapter one. And we can see right off the bat that, Neb that Belshazzar, in this context, has made a great feast. So he's um, invited a whole bunch of friends, uh, lords, his wives, uh, and, and so on. And it says, when he had tasted the wine, he commanded that the vessels of gold and so on be brought. In other words, Belshazzar is basically having, I mean, feast is a generous term, right? He has concubines there, wives and such. It's, it's more of like a orgy, drunken orgy. And as he begins to drink the wine, he then gets it into his head that he would like to bring out these uh, cups and goblets and bowls and stuff out of the treasure house that came from Jerusalem's temple. Now you'll notice he doesn't pick Assyrian cups or Egyptian bowls, but rather the ones that belong to the temple in Jerusalem. That's, that's his significant. But also that he is drunk while he's doing it. Uh, the other little piece that might be helpful is to notice that Daniel has been utterly marginalized. When, when the question turns up how to, how to interpret this uh, writing on the wall, uh, the queen mother has to say, well, there is a man in your kingdom. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar had made him chief of the, of the Magi. So Daniel is unknown. He's, he's, well, or at least he's been totally marginalized from the government in Babylon under Belshazzar and his father Nabonidus. So uh, we, we are getting an insight into how Belshazzar views these temple vessels, right? His father, Nebuchadnezzar, meaning his ancestor or a, a previous king, uh, the prominent king Nebuchadnezzar, when he had brought the vessels, he actually sought in his own way to honor the God of the Jews by incorporating those, uh, that f furniture and such into the house of his own God. Uh, here, now granted that it, was, it made God, Yahweh one among many gods and was a distortion, but nonetheless, he was seeking to honor Yahweh in the, way, in the best way he knew how. In the case of Belshazzar, he's not seeking to honor these vessels by drinking wine out of them. He's seeking, on the contrary, to humiliate the Jews and their religion. And uh, so, like the first story begins with Daniel drinking, or excuse me, refusing to drink the wine that was in the palace, uh, or that was offered or commanded by Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that back in story one, chapter one. Now we get a story where the drinking of the wine is the beginning of trouble. It's his indulgence in the wine uh, that is the start of the trouble. Uh, so what is being critiqued? Well, you can picture Belshazzar there. He's mocking uh, Yahweh, he's praising the gods of gold and silver, meaning he's, pr he's praising gold and silver, wealth, as if it's a god. Because really in the world, Marduk and Ishtar and Yahweh, they're not really the movers and shakers. They're not what ultimately determine what happens in the world. It's money. That's where you find real power and real satisfaction. You see, Belshazzar is indulging in the wealth and the pleasures, the delights that come from that wealth. And he's celebrating the wealth and the pleasures that come from it. And he's delighting in the concubines, his wives, and so on. And they're all drinking. So this is, uh, this is an example of hedonism, of course. So what is being critiqued in the Babylonian culture is their attitude toward wealth and pleasure their attitude toward wealth and pleasure. They've turned, Belshazzar is not interested in real religion. He doesn't, 
he doesn't have some basic level of respect like Nebuchadnezzar had for religion in general. He sees religion, at least when under the influence, as just something to mock. He has no fear that there are gods, whether Yahweh or Marduk, it's just not of a concern to him. He's interested in practical realities, the things that really make a difference in the world. So this is a, an insight into his attitude toward wealth and pleasure. It's an attitude which per, it pervades until this day in modern pagan cultures, Gentile cultures, or cultures which are in, uh, less religious or increasingly less religious and more secular. And so we get this critique of uh, wealth now uh, and pleasure. Now the question is, um, when God is going to communicate and offer his critique, why does he specifically choose the method he does to communicate? He sends fingers, the fingers of a hand, to write on the wall. Why doesn't he just send an angelic messenger to just tell Belshazzar? Why doesn't he just sell, send Daniel directly to communicate to Belshazzar what God's message is? Why not, uh, uh, why not have the hand write on the table <laughs> or the floor? Uh, so all of these questions then, um, what are getting at the, this thing? Why is it that God is going to reveal his message in the precise manner he's going to? What does that in itself accomplish or communicate? And then secondly, why didn't Belshazzar just read the, right, the hand on the wall as a positive omen? Why couldn't it be a positive sign from the gods rather than a negative one? His, it says his knees were shaking, his limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. Why, why does he react that way? Why not just interpret it as a positive omen of, of affirmation? All right, so there's a couple of questions you can dig into. Best wishes, and we'll see you next time.